Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk about production techniques used in machining. When machining multiple identical parts, it's possible to save a tremendous amount of time by employing just a few basic work holding techniques that eliminate the need to locate each individual piece. After all, the vast majority of machining time is actually spent locating the edges or the center point of your workpiece. By holding your parts in a way that ensures a repeatable location from part to part, you'll only need to find the edges or touch the tool off on the very first part. The techniques I'm about to show you are used extensively in CNC machining, but they're equally useful in manual machining as well. Collet stops are used to set the location of a part along the spindle axis of the lathe. Doing so allows you to rapidly face parts to the same length or machine features with relation to the end of the workpiece. With the help of a collet wrench, the collet stop is threaded tightly into the end of the collet. Then the stop rod is adjusted to allow the desired amount of material to stick out from the collet. Lastly, the jam nut has to be tightened so the stop rod doesn't move while the lathe rotates. In use, the part is placed in the collet tightly against the stop rod, which ensures its location, generally within two thousandths of an inch. It's usually fastest to make facing cuts on one end of each piece, just to clean that up. Then you can flip it around, put the machined end against the stop rod, and face the very first piece and measure. That way you know exactly where the stop rod is and therefore where your part is. This also keeps you from having to move the carriage back and forth an excessive number of times. You basically set it in one spot and take all of your cuts. Once that first piece is machined down to length, you know exactly where your target dimension is. You can put all of your other pieces in and face them at that same setting. So I am 90 thousandths too long in this case. When I made this cut, I zeroed my digital readout. I also didn't move my carriage. So I know that the tip of my tool is still at this face and I can just move in 90 thousandths and plow that off. I got that within a half a thousandth. Let's see how close I can get the other ones. There will be a slight amount of variation depending on how tight or loose you make the collet, but most of the time it's pretty consistent. So our first one was a half a thousandth under two inches, right on two inches on that one. right on two inches on that one. Right on two inches. Half a thousand thunder. And this should be our original. Yeah, now we're thousand thunder. So all within a thousandth of an inch and that took maybe in the neighborhood of five minutes total machining time. This demonstration showed cutting things to length, but you could use the exact same technique for turning to a diameter, threading, boring, drilling and tapping, etc. The beauty of this is that 
you don't have to change tools constantly for each part. You can then move on to the next tool and do all of that operation on all of these parts and the call at stop will still locate them in the exact same spot. It really speeds things up considerably. Collet stops are readily available commercially, and of course you can make one yourself. I have a two-part video series on making this one. I'll put a link up here in the corner. Of course, 5C collets are not the only collets that are out there. There are plenty around that are both larger and smaller than 5Cs, and while some may have commercially available collets, that's not always available, so you may have to make one yourself if you want to use a collet stop. It gets a little bit tricky when there are not threads in the back of the collet to screw this into, but there are plenty of ways around that. Some 5C collets don't have threads in the back, and they make stops for those that use an opposing wedge system to spread out and grab the sides of the collet. I've seen some that work like an expanding mandrel as well, where you screw in a tapered bolt and it spreads it out to grab the sides of the collet. All of these are viable alternatives to threads. The stop rods on collet stops are generally considered to be sacrificial, so you can machine those to suit the job. For example, you might want to turn this down so that it will fit into a smaller diameter collet, or you may want to drill clearance holes in it so it doesn't interfere with a drilling or a boring or a threading job. You can also make shorter or longer stop rods depending on your needs. Collet stop extensions are also available, so parts that are longer than the collet can be machined with the aid of a stop. Basically, your collet stop threads into this instead of the end of the collet, and then this threads into the collet. And you can actually stack these up if you can, if you've got a really long part. Uh, you may end up having some wobble issues, so just be aware of that. One issue that I've run into a lot with collet stop extensions is they don't always fit inside the draw tube of a collet closer. So if you have a lever type or a hand wheel type, uh, generally those are uh, opened up a little bit and threaded for the end of the collet, but only maybe about that far, an inch or 25 millimeters or so. And after that, it's the regular ID of the tube that they used, in which case the collet stop may not fit in there. One other really nice thing about 5C collets and collet stops is the sheer amount of tooling that uses 5C collets. Collet blocks, various indexers, etc. You can still use your collet stop and in many cases you can just take it straight out of the lathe and put it into that, uh, that tooling and then immediately go to town machining the milling operations on your part as well. Along the same lines of collet stops, there are also machinable collets available. These are used for holding odd-sized or odd-shaped pieces, such as tapered or eccentric parts, or non-round or asymmetrical parts. They're available in steel, brass, or nylon, and can be machined to almost any size or shape by the user to suit their particular need. Machinable collets are an excellent choice for working on thin parts, such as washers, since you can cut a shallow pocket into the surface that holds the piece concentrically and keeps it from wobbling. In catalogs, these are sometimes referred to as emergency collets, and you can see this one is actually labeled 5CE. As you can see, you can machine a pocket in there with a built-in stop, so you don't need to use a collet stop with them. I've done that on several of these. I've machined this one to 538 thousandths because I have a repeating job that requires that size of stock. This one actually has a Morse Zero taper in it for holding French horn mouthpieces for modification. I've seen a lot of interesting uses for these over the years, such as threading the center hole so you can hold a bolt for modification, or actually drilling and tapping off-center so that you can machine an eccentric onto the end of a bolt head. I've seen people who have machined a pocket into the face on a CNC machine so they can hold a small milled part in the lathe for easier turning and boring operations. When you buy these, they come with three pins in these little holes. That's so you can place the pins in there and clamp it in the collet chuck, and that loads the collet against them. And then you can go ahead and do all of your machining, and the collet will not be squeezed down too far, which would result in an oversized hole. 
I actually usually dispense with those pins and I prefer to put shim stock into the slots instead. That way you can machine it as if it was a solid piece and you don't end up getting these interrupted cuts at each of the slots, which is pretty destructive to drill bits and certainly to carbide tooling. Machinable collets are also available in larger sizes that are normally not able to be held by 5C collets. In catalogs, these are called pot collets, and they're sold in a variety of sizes, 2 inch, 3 inch, 4 inch, I think all the way up to 6 inches. They're machined exactly the same way as a regular machinable collet, and again, I like to put shim stock in the slots just to avoid an interrupted cut. You do have to be careful with these because they're quite massive, and if you turn it at high speeds, they start to open up and your part can come loose. Since the collet is machinable, you can actually stamp in identifying marks in here. So I have this stamped for the part that it's used for. Just like any other 5C collet, you can use this not only in the lathe, but in every fixture that uses 5C collets, such as all the various indexing devices and collet blocks and things like that. When lathe chucks have two-piece jaws, the upper jaw that actually grips the part can be replaced with soft machinable jaws. These are usually made of aluminum because they're easy to machine and tend not to mar the part, but steel jaws are also commonly used when more durability is required, for instance, long production runs. These can be used in many of the same ways as machinable collets, such as holding thin parts that would wobble in standard jaws, but have the added advantage of a much larger work envelope, depending on your chuck size, and the ability to clamp on the inside of a part. Machinable jaws are usually rectangular in shape, however, they're also available in a wedge shape, commonly referred to as pie jaws. The advantage to these is a much larger area of contact with the part, which means better holding power. Soft jaws are available for purchase from many different sources, but can also be made in the shop from any convenient stock. I already have a video on using soft jaws on the lathe, and I don't want to repeat myself too much, so I'll just go ahead and put a card up here in the corner linking to that video. Soft jaws are also available for the mill vise, again, usually in aluminum, but steel is also commonly used when durability is desired. These replace the stock hardened jaws and can be machined to suit the needs of the part. They can hold one large part or several small parts like these. They are a very reliable way of holding round parts vertically due to the greater area of contact on the part that's achieved when a pocket is machined for that particular size of stock. You know that that part is gripping almost 360 degrees around as opposed to the regular soft jaws where you're gripping on two tiny points. Moreover, since your jaws are machined like this, the part will only fit in straight up and down because that's how the hole was bored. Again, this is as opposed to regular jaws where that part might be straight up and down or it could be leaning one way or the other. The greatest advantage to soft jaws is the fact that the parts are held in a fixed location. This means that you only need to find the first part you make and all the other ones will be in the same spot. Multiple identical parts can be held together and all features machined in one setup, further reducing machining time. Jaws are available in a variety of thicknesses, widths, and heights to suit the needs of a wide range of parts. Have a relatively tall part? Get some tall jaws. You can get jaws that are 8 or 10 or 12 inches wide instead of the standard 6. There are a lot of vendors out there that sell jaws. These three right here are all bought from different vendors, but you can also make them yourself, and this set down here is made out of a piece of 1 inch by 2 inch aluminum. Of course, if you have a long production run, you may want to buy them or make them out of steel instead of aluminum, since they'll definitely last longer. Another big advantage is shown on these. You can bolt these to the jaw and then make a pass along here and you've got a nice parallel surface to the travel of the table. I've also gone ahead and machined a step right here. Hopefully you can see on camera that this small area here is machined a little bit further back than this shoulder, and that way I have a built-in vice stop. When you're machining a brand new set of these, you need to close them on something other than just the vice jaws themselves. So depending on the part, I'll usually close them onto a parallel, 
and clamp them tightly, making sure that I'm not going to machine into the parallel. And that way I've got that gap. Now I can machine any little pocket that I want, and I know that uh, the jaws are actually loaded in the correct position, and the part's going to fit perfectly when I use it in the vise. You can also hopefully see that I mark which one is the fixed jaw and which is the movable. I've got a F and an M. That way when I'm setting back up after I've torn down the setup and now the job's repeating, I can set these things back up and I know exactly where they were machined. What I will do is tighten up the movable jaw first and leave the fixed jaw slightly loose and then I'll get some of the parts, some of the blanks, and I'll put them in there, close up the jaws onto the blanks, and they will self-center. Uh, then I can draw the movable jaw back and tighten the fixed jaw again. Soft jaws are really fantastic for production work because you always know where each of these pieces is and even on a manual machine you can take great advantage of this. So in this case when I machined these soft jaws, I've got my parallel in there, I went ahead and machined each of the pockets one inch apart on the center. So or you could do 25 millimeters or whatever it is. Your spacing can really be anything. The great thing about that is, is I know the coordinates for all of these hole locations, so I can put my blank on there, and I know that it would be the exact same coordinate for all those hole locations, offset by an inch, and then another inch, and then another. And on CNC machines, they actually have fixture offsets. So each one of these would be a fixture offset, and you would only have to write the program once then offset it to this one, it would run again, offset it to that one, so on and so forth. For manual machines, obviously you've got to do all the movements yourself, but you know where each of these coordinates are, and you just keep moving over and run the exact same coordinates. Vice stops and table stops work in basically the same way. They're a hard stop that parts are placed against, so the edges of your blanks are always in the same spot. Vice stops can be small like this that bolt onto the jaw itself. And I've got a video on actually making this particular vice stop as well as how to use them. I'll put a link to it up here in the corner. This is another variety of vice stop that clamps onto the jaws. Uh, both of these are homemade. They're very simple projects and really great projects for the beginner. They also have vice stops that bolt onto the back of the fixed jaw of the vise. Those are adjustable and you can generally use those with slightly larger parts that would still be held in the vise. But I don't actually own one of those and I've never gotten around to making one. Maybe that'll be a future video. Table stops are bolted directly to the table and are also adjustable. They're very well suited to use on parts of any size and can be used on parts that are held directly on the table as well. Both of these are homemade and they're really simple to make. Again, a pretty decent beginner project. Um, I actually like this style a little bit more because you can angle the stop rod. Plus, there's only one knob right here that loosens up the clamp and the stop rod and allows you to pivot. So there's only one thing to tighten and I don't have to hunt for an Allen wrench like on this one. This one also requires you to loosen up two different screws in order to make your adjustments. I'm actually planning on doing a build video sometime soon on making one of these guys. It really is a great project and it's a very versatile table stop. I have them both here and at work and I use them all the time. I really appreciate the fact that I can get the stop rod all the way down to the table pretty much in case I've got a part mounted directly there. It also has this thin tip and a pointed tip as well depending on what you're stopping. The terms jig and fixture can be used to describe any purpose-built device for holding and locating a part. The main difference between the two is that a jig holds a part or guides a tool but is not machined into when in use. A fixture on the other hand is considered sacrificial and is often thrown away, scrapped, or repurposed after the production run is finished. Either can be made from any conveniently available material, even wood. There's no particular shape to either one. They're designed with the part in mind. Common features are machined pockets, fences, or dowel pins to locate the edges of the parts, tapped holes for clamping purposes, 
and hardened drill guides for quickly locating and drilling holes in the part. These are commonly used on jigs that are used on the drill press or with hand drills. The possibilities are only limited by your imagination. I use medium density fiberboard quite often, also called MDF, because it's cheap, it's readily available, it's reasonably flat, and there's absolutely no way that it's going to damage your tooling. These pictures are great examples of why it works so well for fixtures. You can screw the part directly down to it, you can access and machine all sides, and you can drill or mill into it without worrying about chipping your carbide or breaking a drill or drilling into your table. The one downside to MDF is that you can't use any kind of cutting oil or cutting fluid of any kind because it will cause it to swell and affect your fixture. I've got one more example that I want to show you and this was a large piece of acrylic. I think it was one inch thick by six inches by 48 inches long. I used T-slot pins to align it in the Y-axis and then I used a table stop on the end to align it in the X. I had, I believe, six of these to do and it was a, a project for the local Army Corps of Engineers office that is in partnership with the university. These were used for simulating a lock in a river and they were injecting some kind of slurry between plates. Uh, we went through several iterations, the very last of which was a huge piece of stainless that weighed 900 pounds. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comment section below. Hit the like and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.